So thank you so much to everybody who's joining us. Um, my name is Ashley Grant, and I'm the director of the Post-Secondary Readiness Project here at Advocates for Children. Um, and you are joining us for Getting to Graduation, the Rights of Students Age 17 to 22. Um, and we have um, ASL interpretation available, and there is also closed captioning in, available on your screen. Um, additionally, there is a Q&A function available on your screen. Please let us know if you have any questions um, using that tool. And we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, so uh, I'm going to ask my um, colleagues that here on the panel to introduce themselves. Like I said, I'm, I'm Ashley Grant from Advocates for Children. I'm here with um, my colleague, Juliet. Hi hey everyone, my name is Juliet Eisenstein and I work with Ashley. I'm a staff attorney at Advocates for Children in our post-secondary readiness project. And we are also thrilled to be joined by Evan Orfila. Hey everybody, good evening. My name is Evan Orfila. I'm a senior advocate counselor at Liberation of Pomo Plus High School, which is a transfer school. I'm also an alumni at Liber former Liberation and I'm an consultant consultant. So we're gonna um, provide you a little bit more information about us and then ask you a little bit about the folks who are here in the room and then we will get started with our, um, the sort of nuts and bolts of our webinar. Um, so first, Juliet and I are here from Advocates for Children or AFC and AFC is an independent agency that protects the rights of all New York City students. Um, we do that through a number of ways. One is we offer um, helpline services. The number is on your screen and anyone in New York City with questions about your rights in public school can contact that number and um, speak to an education specialist um, in your language about any questions that you have about New York City Public School. We also have a lot of guides and resources, including information about graduation and options for older students on our website, which is linked here. We also offer many workshops and trainings like the one you're participating in right now. And we also provide free legal services to low income families um, for when, student, when families need additional assistance to resolve uh, matters happening in New York City Public Schools. This entire webinar is being recorded and the PowerPoint presentation will be sent to you after the um, webinar. Um, so all of these links will be available to you at the close of the webinar. All right, guys, um, for me. So SCOTSA has worked over, the de over a decade with educators to create a more equitable society by fostering a culture of compassion, respect, and high expectations in public so students who were once left behind can thrive. In a shorter sense, what El Scoto wants to do is bridge the gap between being culturally sensitive and culturally responsive to current form of education. They want to align educators with students for individuals who slip through the cracks so they still have an opportunity to graduate and be successful in life. Thanks, Evan. Um, and so now we just want to run a quick poll. We're interested in who is here today. So um, there should be a poll up on your screen. And the question is, are you a student? Are you a parent? Are you an educator? Or are you another professional? Let's give folks a couple more seconds to complete that poll. I see that we've got about 75% of people have done so. Give you another 10 seconds to fill that out. All right, so it looks like, um, I'm gonna go ahead and close this. Um, it looks like about 63% um, of us are professionals. Um, we've got a couple of educators um, and about a quarter of the room are parents. Um, and it's also fantastic to see that we have a student here. So thank you so much. Um, we would also like to know where you guys are from. So um, I'll launch another quick poll. So where in New York do you live? Um, this training is specific to New York City. There will be some information that's applicable, but it's a really New York City focused training. So we're curious about where you are from. Um, and fantastic, folks have already completed that. Um, so it looks like we've got a nice distribution across the boroughs, across, across four of the boroughs, um, and a few people from outside, from outside of New York City. Um, 
So this webinar is really going to be focused on the rights of overage students here in New York City. We will talk a little bit about statewide rights, but we're going to be very focused on um, city-based rights and options. Um, and then in the chat, we're just interested in hearing um, why you're here. So if you have questions that you're hoping to get answered, um, please do put those into the, the Q&A or the chat so that um, we can make sure to answer those during um, the course of our webinar. All right. And then lastly, I just want to talk through our agenda for the day. So um, this is how we're going to spend our hour. As I, as I said earlier, we're going to be taking questions throughout. So please do use the Q&A. We're going to be pausing throughout the webinar to answer those questions um, if they're not answered already in, in the, the webinar. Um, like I said, the webinar is also being recorded and you will receive a link um, when it is over along with a copy of the chat. I'm sorry, a copy of the slides. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about first the rights of older students, then their options for um, staying in or returning to school in New York City, and then there will be again some opportunity for Q&A at the end. All right, so we've got a quick trivia question for you. Um, question is, what percentage of New York City students graduate from high school in four years? Um, Let's see, I'm going to launch this poll. Is it 55% of students, 62% of students, 68% of students, 79% of students, or 82% of students who graduate in four years from New York City high schools? Can folks have you more about another minute to weigh in? All right, I'm gonna give you about 10 more seconds to answer this question. All right, so um, we're gonna, I'm gonna share the results here. So most people um, are guessing that it's about 79% of students and you folks are correct. Um, about 79% of students in 2020 graduated in four years. However, if you include students who graduate in their fifth or sixth year last year, that total went up to about 82, a little over 82, 82 and 0.1%. Um, Today, we're really going to be focusing the, on the options of students who need more than four years to finish high school or students who are older for their grade level. Um, this year alone, almost 8,000 students in New York City graduated in their fifth or sixth year. And so we're going to talk about um, options for students to stay in school or return to school when they're older for their grade level. So starting us off is going to be Juliet. Okay, hey, great. Thanks, Ashley. So as Ashley said, we're going to start by discussing what students' rights are in, in high school. So first, students must stay in school until the end of the school year in which they turn 17. So that means that if a student turns 17 on or after July 1st of, let's say, 2021 this year, which is the first day of the new school year, they must stay in school for the entire school year thereafter. So for the entire 2021, 2022 school year. Um, so that's what students must do. Students may stay in school. So they have the right to stay in school until the end of the school year in which they turn 21 or until they get their diploma, um, whichever comes first. And I'm gonna talk about this second uh, box a little bit more in the next slide. So students have the right to stay in school either until they've earned a diploma or until they've turned 21. And when we say turn 21, we mean um, they can stay in, stay in school until the June after your 21st uh, birthday. Um, so if you have a summer birthday, that would be the end of your school year it would end over the summer. But if your birthday is at the way end of August or starting in September, you can stay in school that entire, um, year that you're 21. Um, and your right to stay in school ends with whichever comes first, whether you turn 21 first or whether you earn a diploma first. Uh, most students' eligibility to stay in school ends when they earn a diploma, either a regents, a local, or an advanced regents diploma. 
Statewide, more than 95% of graduates do so in four years, but many students need more time. And students who need more time are more likely to be Black, Latinx, English language learners, and students with disabilities. I also wanna quickly note here that when I say earn a diploma, I'm only referring to a local diploma, a regents diploma, or an advanced regents diploma. There are students with disabilities who are working towards non-diploma credentials, um, something you might've heard as referred to as a SAC or a skills and achievement commencement credential. Um, those credentials are not diplomas. So they do not end a student's eligibility to remain in school. So if a student with a disability gets a credential and they're not yet 21, they can still remain in school until um, the June after their 21st birthday. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the crux of um, things that have happened during COVID, um, the right for students to remain in school even after they've turned 21 because of the school closures last year. So on April or in April of 2021, um, New York State Education Department issued a memo. Um, and in that memo, they said, as you can see on the screen, um, they strongly encourage schools and school districts to allow students who would age out of school um, during this past school year when schools were closed, the opportunity to return for summer school, and if necessary, attend school during the 21-22 school year in order to complete their education and earn a diploma, credential, or endorsement. Um, so essentially, even though typically eligibility ends when you've turned 21, um, state ed issued a memo um, giving guidance to school districts to give students more time to graduate because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so in New York City specifically, what this means is that students who turned 21 last school year can stay enrolled or they can re-enroll um, in a New York City high school for this 21-22 uh, school year to continue working towards their diploma. Uh, so students can either return to the last high school that they were um, a student at, or they can enroll in a transfer school or a YABC program. Um, and they can do so through the end of June, 2022. Um, and we're gonna talk about what each of those options means um, during the rest of the presentation. Okay. I think we're ready to go to the next slide. I'm sorry, we're having some technical difficulty oh, changing no. this slide. Sorry, folks. Okay. All right. Can you see that slide? Yes, I can see it. Um, so on this slide, we just have links um, to the New York City um, High School Academic Policy Guide um, and on the screenshots of the New York City DOE website um, where you can find details about the New York City DOE's policy um, that students who aged out last year um, can return to school this year um, or enroll in a transfer school or a YABC um, even though they would have otherwise um, aged out last year because of the pandemic. So these are just easy links that you can access to find out exactly where the DOE is putting this information um, so that you have access to the source of it if you know anyone were to ever question the policy or wanted more information. Um, we're going, um, okay, yeah. Do we wanna, we can pause here for questions um, to see if folks have any questions about um, just that general extended eligibility policy and the rights to remain in school. And then um, we will keep moving forward. All right, it looks like we don't have any more questions at this point. Um, so do feel free to put questions into the chat um, and we will, we will have additional opportunities to stop and answer those. Okay, great. So 
as I just mentioned, um, if you turn 21 last school year, um, the DOE is now giving you the option to return to school um, this year, even though you would have otherwise aged out last year. Um, and so how do you return to your last school? Um, in general, if you leave your high school, you can return to the same school that you were previously enrolled at any time during that school year. Um, Generally, students who return to high school in a different school year than the school year they left um, would need to go to a family welcome center to re-enroll in school. But high schools can readmit students who turned 21 last year um, without having to go through the family welcome center. Um, so because of COVID, um, you can just go directly to your school, either contact, um, we recommend your parent coordinator or the principal at your school, let them know that you would like to re-enroll um, and they should be able to do so without you having to identify um, the Family Welcome Center in your borough to re-enroll. If you have any roadblocks in doing so, we really strongly encourage folks to reach out to AFC for help. Let us know you're having these issues. You can either call our helpline, the number on the slide, or you can email us at agingout at advocatesforchildren.org um, for help. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about what options students have um, in re-enrolling or re-engaging in school. Um, so for older students, uh, the DOE has a number of alternative school options in addition to their traditional high school programs. Um, and these include transfer schools, YABCs, high school equivalency programs, and what's called Restart Academy. We're going to talk about each of these options in turn first what each of these programs are, and then how students um, can get into them. So I am going to pass it off to Evan now to talk about transfer high schools. Okay, so what are transfer high schools? Transfer high schools are typically small schools for overage and undercredited students. Students will still earn a regular high school diploma. They can earn up to 18 credits a school year. Most classes are small and offer extra support. We have a post-secondary planning, and most have to have already done one full year in a previous school before going into a transfer school. So what is the purpose of a transfer school? Transfer schools are academically designed to re-engage students who are either dropped out or have slipped through the cracks. The schools operate and are most productive when the classes are small because with smaller classes, teachers can focus more on students. Advisors have more time to be detailed and oriented on not only academics, but post-secondary readiness and give individualized attentions to students. On top of that, the benefit of going to a transfer school is they also have a learn to work program, learn to work program, which usually offers an internship that is a career, a career path that transitions from high school into whatever the student's post-secondary readiness options are. The only downsides that may come with a transfer school is some transfer schools aren't properly equipped to deal with extensive IEPs, meaning if a student has a severe disability, the school may not be able to meet that student's needs. Um, the process usually is very easy and simple. Um, some transfer schools require an intake, uh, an application, but most important is your records, which come with a transcript, IEP if a student has one, proof of identity and immunization records. Uh, next step is getting into a transfer high school. So what a parent, a student, a counselor would want to do is research the transfer schools in their local area so the student won't have to travel far. Contact that transfer school to see if that's a good school for the individual. The guardian or parent can send over the records to the transfer school or have their prior school in certain exceptions, request the documents for the new transfer school. After that, you'll go through an intake process and that intake process will basically assess where the student is now. So the counselors, staff, and teachers can meet them at their immediate need and work on progressing them after. And then after, you go for a follow-up and 99% of the time, the student usually gets accepted. Next slide, please. All right, so I'm gonna pass it back on to Juliet, thank you. Great, thanks, Evan. Um, so I'm just gonna briefly touch on ch charter transfer schools. So 
similar um, to what Evan said, except that these are not um, DOE run schools, they're charter run schools, um, but they are still the same in nature um, in that they are transfer schools and tend to serve um, students um, who are over age and under credited um, and can help students earn credits at a faster pace. Um, so there's a list of charter transfer school options in New York City um, on the slide. Um, and it's important to note too that these schools take students throughout the year. So you don't necessarily need to enroll in the fall. Um, they will accept students on a rolling basis. Okay. So now we're gonna pause do, for any questions about transfer schools. So one question that we're getting in the chat is, is there a difference between a regular high school diploma and a Regents diploma? Um, and Blanca, thanks so much for this question. Both a Regents diploma and a other diplomas, including a local diploma, have the same course requirements. Um, a local diploma is available to students with disabilities or um, students without disabilities who uh, appeal one one or more of their Regents exam scores. So um, following this present the this webinar, we will also circulate um, a tip sheet with information about all of the various graduation pathways in New York State. Um, and there's some additional information on our website about that that we'll share with you guys following this webinar. And I think um, after that, I think we will move on to YABCs. So it's back to Evan. So YABC stands for Youth Adult Borough Centers. And what are YABCs? YABCs typically are categorized into four different boxes. From ages 17 and a half to 22, they still earn a high school diploma. They do offer paid internships and they offer afternoon classes Monday through Thursday. Now, some of you may ask, well, what's the difference between a transfer high school and a YABC? YABCs usually tend to have a higher level of maturity. In retrospect, you can look at it as YABC as an adult or college class. There's usually less support. Um, most of the time, often a few equipped to deal with students with special needs, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, and students who, are, who attend a YABC still earn a high school diploma from their original transfer, I mean, their original high school. Now, the benefits of doing a YABC is a student who may have a family to support or needs to take care of during the day can still work in the morning and still achieve a high school diploma by going to classes in the afternoons. Most transfer schools do not offer that option. Most transfer schools still follow a regular traditional high school hours from either eight to four or eight to three. Next slide, please. Well, then the next question has to be, how do you get into a YABC? Well, first you have to get or stay enrolled into a regular high school. You would have to speak with a, a guidance counselor to fill out a Y1 and a Y2 form. A Y1 and a Y2 form are two forms that a guidance counselor usually refers or fills out. One of them is that the guidance counselor is referring you to the program. And then the other one is a course and credit requirement. So the YABC knows where the student is before the student gets accepted. Then you take the Y1 form and the Y2 form to the YABC program in your community or your neighborhood, and then you start your YABC program. Just like transfer high schools, they go through a similar process. Some require an application, some want copies of records, some of them may ask just simple questions, but the most important thing is usually to always prep the student before going to a YABC or a transfer school. So it's best to assess the student when they get into the program to help us achieve their ultimate goal in graduating. Uh, we're going to move on to the next slide. And I'm going to pass it. Oh, I'm sorry. This is also my slide. So paid internships, learn to work programs. Thank you. All YABCs and some transfer schools offer a learn to work program. Job readiness and career exploitation activities. Paid internships up to 15 hours a week during the school year. Often you will talk to a learn to work coordinator at your YABC or transfer school to join. Now the importance of a learn to work program inside transfer schools and YABCs is to help the student transfer from high school into a career path that best fits and suits them. The internships are usually course or career focused on the specific individual students needs. Uh, the benefits of this is that if you do have a student 17, 18, 18, 19, 20, or 21, they can get steady work 
have experience and then transition into their field. If we look at it from a different perspective, think about it as going to college and taking an internship and then completing college, starting the career path. Oh, now we'll continue to talk and we'll move on um, to speak and dive into high school equivalent programs and a restart academy. But before we do this, we're gonna take a quick pause to see if anybody has any questions or concerns. Put it in the chat, we'll get right to you. So we've got some questions here about getting extra um, tutoring um, if a student is behind in school um, and has an IEP. So if a, if a student needs additional assistance in, in math or any other subject um, you and has a disability, you can certainly uh, request an IEP meeting with your IEP team and ask if there is additional assistance. Um, this year, the Department of Education is offering recovery services to students with disabilities who missed out on their IEP service services during the pandemic. Um, and we can provide some additional information regarding recovery services following this webinar. So we'll include that with the information that goes out. Um, though in, in any time, parents can always um, ask for an IEP meeting to request additional supports. Um, and that could include something like working with a special education teacher support service to receive those supports. Um, these set services and other special education services are available within transfer schools um, and should be provided to students both within YABC programs and high school equivalency programs that we're talking about next. Um, that said, these schools are smaller and don't always have all of the supports of written into students IEPs. So we would encourage you to reach out individually um, to Advocates for Children if you have concerns because your IEP is not being implemented at one of these programs. All right, it looks like those are all the questions that we have about um, YABC programs and transfer schools. So we're gonna move on and we'll have a little more time for Q&A um, at the end. Okay. So now I am going um, to talk about um, another way to complete high school, which is by getting your high school equivalency diploma. Um, so a high school equivalency or an HSC diploma is equivalent to a high school diploma. Um, in order to get an HSC diploma, you sit for the task exam, uh, formerly known as the GED. Um, and there are different subtests to the task exam. If you pass these subtests, you can get um, a high school equivalency diploma. Um, something important to note is that if you are 18 or under and want to get your HSE diploma, you must be enrolled in a course um, where you prepare to take the exam in order to sit for the exam. Um, if you're older than 18, you can just go ahead and sit for the exam. But if you're younger, um, you must uh, enroll in a course as well. Um, because these are equivalent to high school diplomas, they are still good for the co for college, military, jobs that require a high school diploma. Um, that said, it's not a quick fix. Um, this is a difficult exam. It often we see take students several years um, to prepare for prepare for it and pass all of the sections. Um, so it's not necessarily um, an easier solution um, than working towards a diploma. Um, Something that is important to note um, that has changed in the past few years um, is that previously you had to pass at least one task subtest. So there are different subtests in different subject areas. You used to have to pass at least one subtest and you could replace the other subtests with passing regents diploma or regents exam scores, sorry. Um, but as of April, 2018, you can actually substitute passing regents exam scores for any of the task subtests. So that means if you're a student who has passed all of the regents, but it's just really struggling to get those credits that you need for a diploma, um, a task, uh, the task exam might be a good fit for you um, because you can use those regents exam scores towards the task subtests to get your high school equivalency diploma more easily than you might be able um, to get a high school diploma. Okay. Um, so the DOE has programs um, called Pathways to Graduation or P2G programs um, that they provide, which are courses that students can enroll in to prepare for the task exam. Um, these programs are free. 
They serve students ages 17 to 21. They're offered both in the day or evening, um, full-time and part-time. Um, they're taught by credentialed teachers. Um, they do offer more limited supports for students with disabilities. They're not as supportive. Um, some offer bilingual um, programs in Spanish, um, but not all. And they also all have um, CBO partners or community-based organizations that they work with and that are often co-located in their school buildings um, so that students can access the resources of those organizations um, while they're attending the HSE program. Um, one other thing to note is that if you are 17 years old, um, you really uh, need parental approval as well as administrative approval um, in order to enroll in these programs. Um, they're often looking for students to be 17 and a half to 21, um, but will consider a younger student under extenuating circumstances. Okay. So how do you get into an HSE program? Um, the first step is to visit a referral center. Um, we'll drop a link in the chat um, to the website where you can locate your nearest one. Um, if you are under 18, you should go visit a referral center with um, your parent um, or guardian. Um, you then would attend orientation. These orientations are offered on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Um, you then need to take what's called the TABE test, which is um, a test that will determine your academic levels um, so that it can place you in an appropriate course. Um, and then you would meet with a counselor to choose which high school equivalency program to enroll in. Um, there are also non-DOE run high school equivalency programs. Um, and I will also um, drop a link in the chat for those programs um, as well. And then I'll quickly touch on Restart Academies. Um, so this is another alternative program for students. Um, these offer mental health supports, behavioral health supports, um, as well as substance abuse treatment uh, for students who that might be appropriate for. Um, they are taught that they're run and taught by DOE teachers. Um, and they also offer programs for overage middle schoolers, um, which otherwise may be hard to find. Um, so they serve middle school, high school, and they also um, offer high school equivalency programs. Um, most of them are day programs, but there are also some residential programs that are offered. Um, and you should contact the program directly um, that you're interested in in order to enroll. Um, students typically stay for about one year at a Restart Academy. It's not necessarily a long-term place um, that they go to. Um, and they also have programs specifically for um, court-involved youth, um, including at a program we'll talk a little bit more about later called Co-op Tech um, for 16-year-olds. Okay, so I'm going to just pause here for any questions that have come up. So one question is, are the P2G referral centers open to meet with counselors and to take the TABE? Um, thanks, Melissa. When we reached out to District 79, which operates the P2G referral centers um, last week, we were told that the process described here is accurate as of this fall. Um, so there should be folks available at those centers, both to meet with students and to administer the TABE. Um, and there's also some questions about um, at what point a student has been dropped from school um, or discharged from school. So generally students can be students who are under 17. So students who are still compulsory age, those are the students um, who are still required to attend school cannot be discharged for attendance. Students who um, have reached the end of the school year in which they turned 17, can be discharged from school if they are absent for 20 consecutive days. And if their school holds what is called a planning interview um, to create a plan with the student and the parent um, to address any, any um, attendance concerns that may be happening and to inform the student that they have the right to return to school until the end of the school year in which they turn 21. 
Um, even if a student is discharged following one of those planning meetings, um, students always have the right to return to school until the end of the school year in which they turn 21. And as Juliet said, this year, even students who turned 21 last school year are able to return to their New York City high school. Um, so sort of with what day the student left the register um, shouldn't be relevant in this conversation. The question is really, did the student age out during the 2021 school year? If so, they're able to come back this year. And if they have not yet aged out, all students have the right to return to high school until they graduate with a, a, a Regents local or advanced Regents diploma. Ashley, if I may just add one thing before we continue. Uh, usually in transfer schools, there's three letters that go out after students miss an excessive amount of days. Um, after the three letters, when they usually have the intervention program to officially discharge a child. However, if a student does come to school within those uh, letter time periods, the letters restart and the 20 days have to restart over. Thanks, Evan. That's helpful. Are there other questions about um, transfer schools, YABCs, Restart Academy programs, or HSE programs before we move on? All right, so we'll move on um, and we'll still keep the Q&A open and we'll have some time at the end to answer additional questions. Okay. So now I'm gonna turn and talk about other supports that are available to high school students um, attending um, DOE schools um, that may be of particular interest to older students. Um, so these supports include childcare, vocational training, paid internships, and transition consultation. And we're gonna talk about each of these in turn. Okay, so first is child care, um, which entails the LIFE program, um, which stands for Living for the Young Family Through Education. Um, and this is free daycare um, and parenting classes for DOE students who have children. Um, your child must be between eight weeks and three years old, and the parent must be enrolled in a DOE school or high school equivalency program. Uh, LIFE runs about 30, I think a little bit more than 30 centers in all five boroughs of New York City. Um, and also important to note, the parent does not have to be enrolled at the same school where the, li the LIFE center is located in order to enroll their child there. Um, I just want to make a few quick notes about students who are pregnant as well. Uh, pregnant students are required to attend school unless they are prevented from doing so due to medical reasons, um, in which case they may apply for what's called home instruction to receive instruction at their homes. Uh, schools also must provide reasonable accommodations and supports services um, to parenting students when they return to school. Um, and so these are just uh, things to keep in mind if you um, are or know of a student um, who also uh, is in need of childcare while they attend school. And that's something that's presenting a barrier for them enrolling in school currently. Okay, next I'm going to talk about vocational training um, primarily through a program called Co-op Tech. Um, so in order to enroll um, in Co-op Tech, which is a DOE run program, you must be 17 years old, you must have a diploma or be enrolled in a DOE high school uh, or high school equivalency program. Um, they offer half day programs for students who are enrolled in high school or DOE um, pathways to graduation programs. Um, and they offer um, evening or night programs um, for students who have diplomas um, and who um, want to come uh, get vocational training, um, you know, after, for instance, a day's work um, or other programming they have during the day. Um, Co-op Tech teaches um, industry skills. It provides um, training and credentials in different trades, um, from building trades to health trades, um, IT, service industries. They offer a ton of different programming. There are satellite sites in each of the five boroughs. Um, the main site is in um, on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. Um, if a student is currently enrolled in a high school or a high school equivalency program, what they would do is attend um, their high school classes during the first half of their day. And then they would come to co-op tech for the second part of their day to get vocational training. Um, 
in an industry of their choosing. They can uh, usually select um, which program they're interested in, you know, working towards a vocational credential in. Um, if you're interested in enrolling in co-op tech, um, you can call the number on the screen or also visit their website, um, cooptech.org. Um, they accept students for both the fall and the spring semesters. Okay. Next, I'm going to talk about paid internships. Um, so Evan touched on the Learning to Work program, which is offered at YABCs and transfer schools, which is a way for students at those programs to get paid internship experiences. Um, here are a couple of other ways that students can get paid internship um, experiences, even if they're not enrolled in a transfer school or a YABC. Um, so these are SYEP, which stands for the Summer Youth Employment Program, and Work, Learn, Grow. Um, so these are paid internships that are funded through DYCD, um, and they're offered to people who are ages 14 to 24 years old. Um, SYEP offers up to 25 hours per week um, of paid work experience during the summer. And Work, Learn, Grow offers up to 10 hours per week of paid work experience during the school year. Um, it's also important to note that in order to do Work, Learn, Grow, you have to do SYEP first. Um, so all students can do SYEP or all students can um, apply for a slot um, in SYEP. And then in order to apply for Work, Learn, Grow, you must show that you've already completed um, a SYEP uh, summer program. Usually the application window for SYEP opens in March um, and it's a very short application window. Um, so we urge you to keep your eye out for it. Um, and Work, Learn, Grow applications are usually due in October. Um, these programs also offer priority for students with disabilities, um, for students in temporary housing, and for court-involved students. Um, and there's a link on the slide if you are interested um, in learning more and entering the lottery. Um, you can click on that link uh, to see what the application looks like. Okay. So the final um, additional support that the DOE offers um, to students is transition consultation. Um, so the DOE has told us that they are going to continue offering consultative services um, through their TCACs, um, which stands for Transition and College Access Centers. Um, so these are centers they have in each of the five boroughs, and they're gonna provide consultative services through these centers for students who aged out after the 2020-2021 school year. These um, consultation services are different from more time in high school. Um, instead, they're more, uh, more seen as additional supports that you can get um, to help you reach your post-secondary goals. So these can include one-to-one -one supports, either in person or remotely, help applying to college or vocational programs, um, they can help assist you um, in going through the Access VR intake process and getting your documents together to apply for Access VR. Um, they can assist with OPWDD applications. They can review documents, make calls with you, reach out on your behalf to other service agencies. Um, and they say that they will provide these services until whatever adult services that you're looking for um, are set up and in place. Um, so students who have already otherwise finished or aged out of high school can still participate in these consultation services um, by accessing the TCAC in their borough um, and you know, asking for the specific post-secondary help that they are looking for in order to meet um, their post-secondary goals. Um, and usually these are pretty individualized services, so you should really we advocate asking for any sort of transition supports that you feel um, that you need uh, to be successful after high school. Okay, in order to get these services, um, step one is accessing a TCAC that's located in your borough. Um, so if you click on the link on this slide, you'll see um, where all the different TCACs are located um, and how to contact them. Uh, if, you, if you or your student was um, part of the District 75 school program, you can also email d75transition at schools.nyc.gov for supports. Um, if that is unsuccessful for whatever reason, you can uh, reach out to special education at schools.nyc.gov um, to request the supports that you're looking for. And 
If for some reason that also is not successful, you can always contact AFC. We are here to help um, when you face barriers to getting access to these services. You can call our helpline at the number on the slide, or you can also email us at agingout at advocatesforchildren.org. Okay, I'm gonna pause here for more questions about those additional supports. Thank you, Julia. One question that we got in the chat was regarding the Department of Education's high school equivalency programs, um, also called P2G or Pathway to Graduation. There was a question about whether there are any P2G services offered for Spanish speakers, and there are some Spanish speaking P2G programs. Um, so when you visit a referral center or when a family is visiting a referral center, we would encourage them to specifically ask for a program that is conducted in Spanish because there are a handful of those around the city. I am not seeing any other questions at this time, so um, feel free to continue to put questions in the Q&A, um, but we will move on to a handful of resources. Yeah, so as we've mentioned throughout the presentation up until this point, AFC, um, the DOE, and also state ed have a ton of resources around the information that we've been talking about. Um, so this slide in particular provides links um, to more information on the DOE's policy around students who are 21 and older and their ability to return to school this year. Um, so there's the academic policy guide, as well as information um, and a link to the DOE's website where um, they say that students who turned 21 last year can return to school this year. Um, and then lastly is the New York State Ed Memo saying that school districts should give students the opportunity to return this year um, who have otherwise aged out. Okay, um, these are uh, resources from AFC as well as from New York State Ed um, on graduation requirements in New York State and New York City and how those requirements have changed during COVID. Um, AFC has previously done a webinar on this and there's a link here on the slide um, if you would like to watch um, and where we go more in depth into regents exam cancellations and how graduation requirements have otherwise changed in light of COVID. Um, and then we also have links to tip sheets um, and these are constantly updated as more information becomes available. Um, so they're a good resource if you are wondering more about how graduation requirements have changed during COVID. And I think that's it. I will pause one final time for questions. Thank you, Juliet. Um, I'm not seeing any questions right now in the chat, but Juliet, um, and thank you so much, Evan, the, all three of us will stick around. So um, if you do have any other questions, we'll stick around for a little bit to answer those. Um, I'm also putting into the chat a survey. We ask that you please give us your feedback by completing this short survey. It is in the chat. Um, it's also gonna be emailed out to you following this webinar. Um, we'd, we'd ask you to fill it out right now if you have the time to do that. And lastly, we are here if you have follow-up questions following this webinar. So um, thank you so much for coming and for, for asking questions and participating in this webinar. As we said, the slides and um, a recording of the webinar will be sent out to you uh, following what, as soon as they, they're available to us. Um, you can also contact our helpline at the number on the screen Monday through Thursday between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. and an education specialist will be available to speak with you in your language. You can also email us at agingout at advocatesforchildren.org um, if you have follow-up questions for, for me or for Juliet or for Evan. Um, and we do just wanna thank Evan for joining us today. It's really a pleasure to have you with us. So thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. You guys are greatly appreciated.